got you hooked. You can't start in the middle. You, you got to start. Hey, come on in, guys. Um, you got to start at the beginning so you can catch it all. Some things that happen in the middle, you'll, you'll get the one. Good evening. 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 Jesus as the light began to began to stand out, began to stand out. First, the light of Jesus, that the light that is Jesus, brings um, an end to and removes chaos and disorder. This light brings peace. Um, in Genesis chapter one, three and three, you don't have to turn there, but Genesis chapter one, I'm sorry, um, verse, verse three. Um, th th this is where God began to set divine order. God dispels the darkness by the command, the word, um, let there be light. And the light overcame the darkness and all the chaos. That, that's important because we've got to uh, understand spiritually, spiritually, darkness, darkness is a breeding ground for, for chaos. Darkness is a breeding ground for chaos. Darkness is a place where, where um, discord and contempt and all those other things that are that are adverse to the word of God can't can breathe, and, and we're gonna look at darkness in a um, a bit more um, singularly in a minute, in just a moment, um, because the light is the opposite of the darkness. Jesus is the opposite of of the devil, and you can even take that as far as to understand um, that 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 in the be that in the creation of God before before God began to create the heaven and earth. Well, well, the earth that wasn't heaven, that wasn't heaven, and and the enemy, um, the devil that that we call the devil now was in heaven, but he was at, he was in heaven as Lucifer. He was an angel of light. He was an angel of light, but but because of of his contempt for the place of God, and he wanted to be in the instead of God, higher than God, um, he, his light was overcome by darkness. Now, that's something to think about. Here is a being created, created to be a worshiper, to be a leader of the praise. But, 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 but his, his light was overcome by darkness because he made a willful choice. He, he made a willful choice to go against the word of God. When you go against the word of God, there is no other way but to, but, but to turn to darkness. There is no other way. Now, um... So, so he was there. He, he was there. And yeah, some of y'all remember in some of our studies past that we we discovered, according to the word, um, Jesus that we know in Jesus in the New Testament. One of his positions, um, um, in the Old Testament was to be the archangel Michael, according to the scripture that we have studied. Um, things about Michael are very um synonymous with what we know about the Son of God. And Jesus was an angel. Jesus was an archangel. Not as Jesus, but as, as the Son of God, his position was of archangel. Satan's position as Lucifer was as of archangel. Those two are, were, were at one point nearly equal. The thing that separated Jesus from the angels was that he was the Son of God. He was the Son of God, chosen by God to not only be with him um, in position, but to also carry out the function of becoming the Savior of the world. And, 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 and when Lucifer 
himself saw fit that he could not obtain a place that would be higher than, than his station, higher than God, because he wanted to be higher than God. That's when he allowed his light to be overcome by darkness. And that's why we have the state that we have in the world now. Yes, sir. But it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but I definitely mean the everlasting. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about it. Everlasting, eternity, it's eternal. eternal. Um, for us, our eternity, our eternity begins when we, when our spirit leaves this body. That's when our eternity begins. Um, the, the promise of it, of of everlasting life is um, to have life in and of Jesus Christ. Life in and of Jesus Christ is not life like we know it right now. Like right now, all of us have life. We are moving, we are talking, we are breathing, we are all of that. That's not living. Actually, what we are, what we are, we are in a state of a, a process that is aiming to die. This this body is in a state where it is processing itself to die. From the time we are born, we are in the process of getting ready to die. It's just that there might be some years and years and years in between, but there, it is still a process. So this life is not really living. This life is more about dying, the life that we have, that we use these natural bodies for. We begin to live when we are uh, a part of and, and, and in relationship to Jesus Christ. When we're in relationship with Jesus Christ, this is what he promises. Um, that John 3, 16, people, whosoever believeth on me, I will give them eternal life, everlasting life. Now, that everlasting life, now, we we talked about what, what we know life to be on this side. Excuse me. What life is in relationship to being with Jesus is now, he promised us life like God has life. Mm -hmm. God has no beginning. God has no ending. We do have a beginning. But when we transform from out of this earthly body and to, to our spiritual being, we also have life everlasting. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the thing. Life, eternal life, is life like God has. But eternity goes two ways. Now, I talked about that it goes back, that's as far as you can think or see, and goes forward. But it also goes, eternity is, is life and death in, in eternity. <coughs> there is life, life and death in eternity. The same way life is not spiritually, the same way life is just not breathing, it is the same way that death in the spirit is just not the absence of breath. Or the absence of blood running warm through your veins. That is not that that is not what death is. Um, um, it's a scripture that we went over in, in, um, a couple weeks ago that talked about death. Spiritual death is separation from God. Jesus promises us that we did, that we never have to be separated from God. That's that's true life. That's true life. We never have to be separated from God. Um, the Bible says that, that 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 the separation from God comes after the judgment. If a person that has lived on this earth closes his eyes and dies, the Bible said it is given unto man um, um, to die. Once they live, then they die, then the judgment. When you face the judgment, either you have lived for, for, for God and you, have, and you receive your promise of eternal life, or you have not lived for God, and you receive the judgment of eternal separation or death. The Bible says it, the casting of, 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 of a soul into hell is the second death. So Jesus promises eternal life, which is living like God lives, living for all eternity, living in the glory of God, living in the presence of God, living by the power of God, living in the joy of God, living in the comfort of God. 
And and their eternal life is important. Because because eternity, like I say, it goes both ways. It goes eternal life or eternal death. And and, and this is the other thing. Eternal death <coughs> spiritually does not mean that you don't know what's going on. Because you do. You know, um um the story of Lazarus, um, the beggar Lazarus and the rich man says Lazarus died and he went to the bosom of Abraham. But the rich man died and he lifted up his eyes in hell. And he felt burnt tongue and he felt discomfort and he was being tormented and he wanted something to drink and he wanted and, and he had enough mind left to know. Had enough mind to know that he still had brothers and sisters back on earth. Well, brothers, they said, on, on earth. Could somebody go back and tell them, don't come to this place? So it's not that you don't know. Eternal death is not the absence of, of a knowledge of what's going on. It is just a separation. But we know we opt for eternal life. Amen? Amen. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 <coughs> All right. All right. Good. Any more questions? Any more questions? All right. All right. Now, talking about that eternal light. Um, well, we're talking about the light. Come on in. You're just in time. I told you. Hey. No, that's all right. I just came for four. Can I share a Bible with somebody, please? Yeah, yeah. I know Bible for you. Especially if you got good eyes. You see a little Bible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we we in um, the Gospel of John, the um, chapter one, um, looking at verses four and five, we get, we're dealing with the light. Um, now, God God dispelled the darkness by the command that there was light, and, uh, and like I said, the light overcame all the darkness and the chaos. Look, without the light of Jesus, we are left in darkness. In the, in the darkness, all of our insecurities and fears are exposed to the enemy. In the darkness, the, the enemy still has a, has the ability to have a field day with you. He has the ability because you're on his territory. You're on his turf. You're in his wheelhouse, so to speak. He can get, he can do near about anything he wants to <coughs> if you're in the darkness. Now look, watch this now. It is a difference being in a dark place covered by the blood of Jesus. It is a difference. It is a difference. It is a difference. Now, when you're in a place that may be dark, and sometimes we are called to go into dark places. <coughs> we are not just called. We don't run from darkness now. Now, let's get that straight. We got power. We don't run from the darkness because if we had to run from the darkness and all the devil had to do was to go in a bad place and we couldn't go there, then we, we would have a mighty weak Christianity. But we have a power within us. We have a power that we can go into the darkness covered by the blood of Jesus and, and go ahead and still get work done. When we're talking about being in the darkness, we're talking about being in the darkness and not know the light. That's the difference. you got to know the light. Because if you know the light, wherever you are, your light will dispel darkness. If this room was pitch black right now, and somebody struck one match, you would know where they at. You would know, no matter how dark it was, you would know, as long as that light was on, you would know where they are. Because light dispels darkness. All right? And, 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 and see, the enemy wants you to be in a place where he got control over you. And any time the enemy got you insecure, and he got you fearful, he got you. Because insecurities and fear they are, they are the tools of the enemy. And he uses those tools to cause you to, to think on and believe in the contradictions to God's word. That, that's what he does. We are left to be insecure in our relationship with God. We are, we are moved to be in doubt about the accuracy and, and the validity of the word of God. This causes us to walk in fear and not faith. This is this is what happened to Eve. This is what happened to Eve. It wasn't that the devil was so slick or, or the serpent was so slick. I mean, he was slick. But what he got her to do was to believe in a contradiction. We talked about this all the time. That gentle 
inflection of the word. She said, God said that if we eat of this tree, we'll die. And he said, he said <coughs> you won't surely die. And right then and there, she began to have contradiction in her mind. But she, when she began to move into the, to the con, con, <coughs> she began to move in her own insecurities. He don't want you to know what he knows. That's what the problem is. Now, she insecure about the God that has created her. The God that has presented her to her husband. The God that has fashioned this beautiful garden. That all these good things for me, but now I'm insecure about his motive. I don't trust him. When I came into this world with nothing, and he gave me everything that I have, but now I'm insecure about him. Now I'm afraid that he that that he's not true to me. He's not gonna treat me right. So what did she do? She take up with the father of all life. Ain't, ain't that crazy? Now ain't that really crazy? Think about this now. God is not a man that he should lie. But folks choose to believe in the insecurity and, 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 and allow their fears to reign. Therefore, they believe in the contradiction to God's word and won't believe what God's word said for, for, for to save their life. And really, God's word will save your life. But that's those that walk in darkness. Any question about that? Also go watch as well as pray. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, keep your God up in the spirit. Because see, in the spirit, you got spiritual weaponry. See, that's part of your spiritual weaponry for from being in the light. From being in the light, you have spiritual weaponry <coughs> that is to safeguard you from the everyday occurrence. As long as your mind is stayed on Jesus, you'll be led. You know, I used to watch this cartoon when I was younger called Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo was blind as a bat. But see, like, he never got hurt. See, like, he'd be walking out the edge or something, and somebody come along, and he'll step on that thing and spring over to the next thing, and he'll end up anywhere. But he never, he couldn't see, but something was always watching out for him. He didn't see the danger. Everybody else might have seen it. He didn't see it, but something was always watching out for him. Same thing with us. If we allow the Lord to reign in our lives, Something he no, he ain't something. He is always watching out for us. He will make the things in your life work out for your good. He'll make all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. You can't, you know, Reverend Knight used to say it, and he used to say it for a little bit of a con. I know he did. But it was true though. You can't lose with the stuff I use. With the stuff we use is Jesus Christ. This is the stuff that we rely on. There's nothing wrong with relying on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we feel like we got to do it all ourselves, and we struggle, and we and we strive to make it and do these things. But we have not prayed, we have not sought the Lord, we have not we have not looked for His help, we have not looked up beyond the hill, looked up beyond the hill unto the um unto the Lord from whence cometh all our help. We have not done that. We have not done that. Therefore, we are relying on our own mind. But the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, relied on relied on God always. Always. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. Father, I'm asking you, give me the strength. Show me your will. Help me. Show, show these people that I'm your son. Because it's not about me, but it's about you. These are the things that we can do. He taught us how to pray. Not I will, but that will be done. That's what he taught us. So those, those are the things that we need to use. Amen? All right. Any questions? So the second thing that the light does. The light that Jesus is, is a revealing light. And we talked about it dispels the darkness, but it is also a revealing light. Without the convicting power of the light, men would stay in the darkness. You don't know, you don't know you're living like that? You really... <laughs> See no reason to change. See no reason to change. Without something being able to convict. Now, I, I do want to make sure that I say this. There is a difference between being convicted in the spirit as being condemned. Condemned means that judgment is forthcoming. Conviction is, is 
is that you're being stopped. You're being impeded from what you are about to do. You're being shown, shown a different way and being, being given the option of making a change for yourself, making a change. Maybe it's not a change that you can do by yourself, but 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 the same spirit of God that is that is stopping you is also willing to rescue you, willing to show you. See that's it. See now in the old church, we was big on on trying to convict people. We wanted to see people get convicted. We church, the old church used to love to see somebody come to church and get to crying. Oh yeah, the Lord getting on them. Get him to get him, Jesus. You know we done sitting there. Stick the Holy Ghost on people and hit them, Jesus, show them. But, but <coughs> really, what that is, is something that all of us should be experiencing. Because all of us have probably got some things that we need to look at and look at again and say, really, mm -hmm. is this pleasing unto God? Shoot, I, I've been convicted many times. I have been convicted in the pulpit. I'm preaching. I'm saying, Lord, say, oh, wow, Lord, this is tough. This is even tough for me. <laughs> Thank you, though, because as long as you can feel that, as long as you can feel, because see, that's, that's spirituality. You know, can I tell you, much as I love to praise <laughs> the Lord and jump and holler and kick and shout, I love to do that. It is more beneficial to me to feel the lifting <laughs> power of the, of the Spirit than it is just to feel the praises all the time. I love to praise now, and I'm wrong with that. But you can praise and holler and shout and still live in just as foul as you can live. Mm -hmm. If you can't feel the convicting power. If you can feel the shouting power, you better be able to feel the convicting power. Because believe me, it's the same spirit. It's just in how you choose to use it. Because see, some folk want, want to use the convicting power. The Lord told me that for somebody else. How about the Lord told you that for you first <laughs> before you go give it to anybody else? How about the Lord told, told it to you first? To you first. Then, then, well, like the Bible said, first get that get that beam off your eye. Then you can see to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. Because, see, you've been convicted. Maybe they ain't been convicted. You know, you know, I just tell y'all the story about me and my earring. Love my earring. I tell you, I just look so good in that thing. I feel good. But <laughs> the Lord convicted me of wearing my earring. Told me to take it out. It was on my 40th birthday. I had no intention, because I planned on being cool for a long time. I had no intention of taking it out. And I'm not, and I, but see, when God told me to take mine off, he did not tell me to make that a doctrine for somebody else. He did not tell me to tell every man that the call yourself a Christian to take his earring off. God ain't never tell me that. He ain't never, he told me to take my earring off. I took my earring off. I had preachers tell me, man, you used to have earrings. And he said, yeah, because you can still see the mark. And um, and it's, it, God said, man, if it was me, man, I'd keep wearing my earring. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but God, he tell you what he told me. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. Right. You know, God, he, because the earring would have fell off. I don't even know. He told me to take it out. But he never told me to tell nobody else that. And I ain't never really thought about it. Other than the fact that I know I ain't crazy enough to do it. I don't do what God don't tell me to do. I try to do what thus saith the Lord. But I was convicted of that. Don't know why. Don't know what difference it made. It might have made some difference. I don't know. But that's what he told me. But he told me. He didn't tell nobody else. Now, now because he didn't tell nobody else, I don't consider him to be a sin to wear here. I don't. But I, I just can't do it. So I move on my merry way. And I, and I tell you, as good as I know I look, and my baby will tell you, I do good. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> we had to turn it to prove it. <laughs> but, but, the Lord told me to take it out. And that's what I did. And I think I've been blessed for it. I've been blessed just for being obedient. Mm -hmm. You see, that was the best for convicting power. Though. That's what the light does. The light puts you in a position. Ooh, what, the Lord put his finger on something? Mm -hmm. Don't. Don't worry about how how much you, you might miss it. I guarantee you, if the Lord put his finger on an area in your life, that area is about to blow up. That area is about to blow up. Whatever that is that God has put his finger on, it's about to, it's about to take off. Because God understands that it's something about that area that needs to be purged. <coughs> Sometimes we need to purge ourselves, to, just like if I really knew what I was doing. I would take that pantry in my yard and cut it back about right now. If I knew what I was doing, I really don't. 
But if I knew what I was doing, I would cut it back I would, to, to cut off some of the dead limbs and cut off some of the little twigs that really can't bear fruit. It is so. Ooh, can I say this? It is some things in your life that ain't that ain't profitable. There are some things in all of our lives that are not profitable. That, and what I mean by that is that they will not bear and hold fruit. They might birth fruit. It's, it's places on that tree that will bring forth buds, but even the buds are going to be too heavy for those little bit of twiggy branches that, that cannot bear the fruit. It is one thing to be able to birth an idea, be able to, to, um, to, to think of something in your spirit, to be able to even, even bring it forth to a life, but it's another thing to be able to sustain that life. And sometimes it's things in our life that the convicting power, not the shouting power, but the convicting power will touch in our lives. And we say, no, but this is still some good. This, can st this is still bearing life. This thing is profitable. But God said, no, I'm not in the long run. In the long run, some of them pears, they're going to come on that tree, they're going to end up on the ground. Without anybody, without them ever coming to their fullness of their maturity mm -hmm. because I couldn't, I didn't cut the tree back. Mm -hmm. Wherein, look, don't cut the tree back, and it look like you got a bigger tree, but guess what? You will have less fruit. Same thing in the spirit. Don't let God put his hand on your stuff that needs to be purged out of your life. And you'll, you'll look like a bigger tree. You'll look full and beautiful, but you ain't good for nothing. You won't be bearing as much fruit as you could bear. That's what the convicting power does. And see, the convicting power is good for us because, first of all, it takes us down a page. It takes us mentally and spiritually down the page where we don't think ourselves higher than we are. The Bible says to, to, to think of yourself soberly, not higher than you ought to think. It says that over in, what is that? 1 Corinthians 12, somewhere up in there, right? You know, yeah, there you go, 12, 2 through 5, or something like that. Yeah, and um, just, um, think of yourself soberly, not higher than you ought to. And part of that is if you don't never sit, if you don't <coughs> sit somebody down every now and then, if you don't never um, correct your children as you should and let them say anything to you out their mouth, pretty soon they're going to say something to make you knock them out. Mm -hmm. But when you could have checked that, sometimes we just need to check things. And, and we need to allow God to check us. We don't want to be checked. That's part of our problem. We don't want to be checked. We don't want nobody to check us. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you allow God to check you, you'll be better off for it. But that's a convicting power. Without convicting power, we will stay in darkness. We, we can call ourselves walking in the light and be walking in the darkness. We can say that we know the Lord and love the Lord, but not doing all his will, and we're walking in darkness. But that's what that light is. The light of Jesus shows us the right from the wrong. And just as importantly, the light of Jesus shows us the way out. Um, write the scripture down. I'm just going to go there just for a moment so you don't have to turn there. Psalms 119, 105. 119.105. Um, and it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Not only will the light show you what's up in the darkness, but it will show you the way out. That's just as important. Too many people don't let the light show them the way out. They know the arrow. And then, can I tell you something? Knowing, knowing, knowing your arrow, and not doing nothing about it, it's tormenting. Tormenting to your spirit because you begin to be at odds with yourself. You begin to be at odds with what you know is right and actually what you're doing. Yeah. If y'all looking for that Psalms 119, 105. It's almost smack dab in the middle of the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> almost. But but that light, that light begins to show things in their true character. And the light removes the ability to disguise some things. It also shows things um, in their true value. Look what the light does. Light, you know, you can't tell. I know my grandmama, my mama couldn't tell me if some of my friends were no good. I ain't believe nothing. I ain't believe because I ain't want to see them in their light. I ain't want to see them until we run until we run in front of the police. Can't hardly get away. Hide, hide, scared to death. Lord, 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 you get me home, you get me home. Oh, Jesus, you get me home, you get me home. God, I won't come outside. I know one time I did something, I ain't come outside for the whole song. Because <laughs> I was scared people were still looking for us. Helicopters and everything. People looking for us. I didn't even do nothing. I'm just in the bunch. They ran, so I ran. Mm -hmm. I should have stayed still. But then, I 
I might have told on everybody because you came outside anyway. <laughs> but I would hang with everybody else. And they come outside for the whole summer. But if I had listened to Mama, you know, I would have known that they wasn't no good. But 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 because they was walking in the light. I needed to walk in the light. We all need to walk in the light. <laughs> when they walk in the light, it will lead us directly to God. You know, truly, we never really see ourselves until we see ourselves in the light of Christ. Un until we see ourselves in Christ's eyes. We really don't know what we look like. We, we really don't know how we act and really what we sound like until we see ourselves in the light of Christ. Because it is in the light of Christ that, that, that we begin to see the imper imperfections. Sometimes we can get to a point where we don't see the imperfections in ourselves. I'm getting it right, boy, I tell you. I shouldn't even tell you. I just probably tell you I did it anyway. It is something like that I look at. It looks like my hairline is not deep. But then I get in a better light, I'm like, dang, I'm getting bald. <laughs> Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Lord, the last thing in this world I want is to go bald. Don't want to. I'm taking all kinds of vitamins, boy. <laughs> but in certain life, <laughs> I got to try to make a hold on for a little while longer, man. I got to make a hold on for a little while longer. I hate you, man. But, but, it's some light. I mean, I just go all the time. Call it my hair growing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a light at that school. It's a light at school. I hate to go in that bathroom. I say, I'm not, I go in that bathroom. Every time I go in there, I look bald as on the way. I say, that must be the true light. The light I got at home is something else. <laughs> but, I'm just saying, we never see ourselves until we get in the true light. And when we get in the true light, then, then it makes all the difference. And when you get in the true light, the true light will make you want to react. It will make you want to change. It will make, see, can't nobody, can't nobody make you want to change like the acceptance of Jesus Christ can make you want to change. I can tell you. I can tell you what's good. I can tell you what's wrong. I can tell you what, which way you should go. But me saying that doesn't mean anything. I can tell you until the cows come home, as they say, and it might not mean nothing to you until maybe, maybe you get somewhere by yourself and, and allow the Lord to speak to you. And all of a sudden, now you hear what I'm saying in a different way. Because that's his job. My job is to tell it. And I, I do a pretty good job of that, but I'm asking the Lord to help me be even better at telling it, putting it out there. Because when we put it out there, we, we allow Jesus to make, to make us available to his choice. And we, and we and when we allow that, that's the best way to come. Because I preach, I witness, I invite, I nurture, I do all those things, but it's still him that brings the increase. Okay? Alright, the third thing, the third thing that the light brings is that this light is a guiding light. Without the guiding light of Jesus, we all walk in the darkness and do not know where we're going. Um, um, and you can turn here if you like. It's still in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 46. Just put your finger on, on John 1. John chapter 12, verse 46. And it says, I, I am come, a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in the house. I am come. Just for the sole reason that you don't have to walk in darkness no more. You don't have to walk in simple ways or confused ways. You don't have to walk in a despairing way. Or even a dysfunctional way. You don't have to. Because that's all the things that darkness is. And sin. That, that's all the things that, that they are. But, but Jesus said, I have come that you may walk in the light. Oftentimes in the gospel we see people um, coming to Jesus, and, and they're asking, what must I do? You know, and, and, and in particular, they're asking, what must I do to be saved? After, after hearing and seeing that Jesus is the light. Well, when the light that is Jesus comes into one's life, the time for guessing and stumbling is over. There's no more doubt. There's no more uncertainty. You ain't got to wonder, am I doing it right? You, tell, you, you can tell whether I'm doing it right or whether I'm doing it wrong by the true word of God. Sometimes, and, and, and this is important, you got to be able to differentiate between what is doctrine of man and what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
that there is a devil. There is a devil. The doctrine of man cannot put you in heaven. Can't put you in hell either. <laughs> it has no power. The interpretation of man can't do that. The only the only interpretations that that bear record is revelations that come from the Spirit of God. And those are things that help explain it to you. They don't change the meaning. If somebody comes to you with a revelation, they say, oh, I get a revelation from the Lord. And God said this and that. And, it, and what they're saying go against the word of God. You know, if the Bible said, be ye holy because I am holy. And somebody comes to you, I got a new revelation. It don't take all that. You can live any kind of way you want to live, do what you want to do, and you can still make it in. That's a lie. See, that's somebody else's doctrine. It was somebody else that really did that. It was a well-known preacher. You know, I don't call a name. But it was a well-known preacher that that came up with this doctrine that you don't need to be saved because everybody's saved, no matter what you do. You do anything you want to do, you say because the Lord loves you. And what the Bible says, be ye holy because I am holy. And it don't mean to be in, the, in a certain denomination. It means to have a certain life and lifestyle. And that is a life and lifestyle that is pleasing unto God according to his will, his way, and his word. If it ain't according to his will, his way, and his word, then you've got problems with it. And, and I don't mean those things that that man has come up with. Y'all heard me tell the story upon the time in my church when I was a little boy, all the ladies had to wear dresses and sweep in the floor. Mm -hmm. All of them. They had to, couldn't, couldn't straighten their hair. Couldn't put on makeup. Wear an earring, oh, you're going straight to hell. Mm -hmm. You know. That was their way of thinking. That was their way of thinking. They had nothing to do with, with your heart. Nothing to do with your heart at all. Jesus is all about the heart. When, when the disciples were, were hungry and they ate some corn out the field and they just grabbed some corn and started munching. The Pharisees, mm, they ain't washed their hands. They unclean. Jesus said, saying it ain't just things that go in the body that make the body unclean. It's what come out of the mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. and see, see, Jesus was about relationship. Jesus was about what was real. Everything else, what was real to Jesus is, will you accept me as the son of God? Will you accept me and believe on me that I can bring you into this place of eternal life? That was the whole mission from the beginning. From the beginning, God had designed it that Adam and Eve have eternal life. That's what he designed it for. How they were going to get to it, we still don't exactly know because the plan got messed up. But that was from the beginning. Because if it wasn't the plan from the beginning, why would God go through all of what he went through to, to, to reconstruct the plan? Because from Genesis 3, from the time that man sinned and fell, God began to put a plan together to restore him to a right place in God. It was a plan all, all along. And that's what the light does. The light makes it so there is no more guessing and stumbling around. No doubt, no uncertainty. This is the way. The way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. These are things that we need to understand. And, and see, folk need to stop getting in God's way and, and, and causing stumbling blocks for people. Putting up all these barriers of what I got to do and what you got to do to be saved. The Bible said to, um, to accept Believe and confess. Simple as ABC. Accept that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that He came and He died for you and your sins. And um, and, and after you believe, repent. And then after you repent, confess. Confess it with your mouth that Jesus is able and has saved me. This is it. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. You ain't got to jump through no hoops. You ain't got to stand on your head. If if that was the case, if that was the case, I bet you. I bet the more people will accept it if they had to do something crazy than if they had to come this simple way. Because this is a simple way. Amen? Any questions about that? All right. Going on to verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. All right. The opposite of the light that Jesus is is the darkness of sin. Let's look at that for a little bit. That word darkness appears in this gospel seven times. Um, first thing I want to say. I want you to know, to John, the darkness in the in the world was real. It was as real. Sin in the world was as real to John as Jesus was. The light was real. It was just that real. It was it was so real. It was so prevalent um, that even look, show you how prevalent darkness was in the earth at that time. From 
from the coming, the birth of Jesus, to the last word that man heard, heard spoke in the book of Malachi, coming out of the Old Testament. Uh, it, was, it was a span of about 400 years that God had not spoken openly. He had not spoken openly. It wasn't until Jesus was about to come onto the scene when the angels came down and began to speak to Mary. And the angels came down and began to speak to John, um, excuse me, John, John's father, Zacharias, and, and John's mother, Elizabeth. It wasn't until that word began to come to Simeon and um, the woman named Anna. Is it Anna? I believe it's Anna. Um, and the word began to come to them that the Messiah was on the way. The, God had not been speaking. That's how much the darkness had prevailed. The darkness had began to prevail over the world. And it was only, it was only a recent development that God began to speak. And there was, stuff, there was still some yet holding on to what they knew about the Old Testament and the rituals and the sacrifice and the worship in the temple, but, but, but they weren't hearing it from God. Can you imagine coming to church Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, and never hearing a word from God? You just coming because you know it's right. That's the only reason why you coming. The faithfulness of your coming just because you know it's right. But how many people, how many people fall by the wayside from from the monotony of trying to do what is right. It is a monotony to doing what is right. I wish I had that scripture because I'm going to use it Sunday or even the next Sunday. i got a series coming up. Um, and, um, and one of the scriptures I'm going to use is dealing with the consistency of doing what is right. Plotting. The Bible calls it plotting in, in, in Proverbs. And I can't say, I think it's Proverbs 13. But it talked about plotting. P-L-O-D-D-I-N-G. <coughs> That is the consistency of doing, doing, doing what you know is right. When everybody, when you get up and go forward in Jesus' name, everybody else is taking a break, having a good time, watching other folks, you know, doing whatever they want to do. But, but that ain't the way. That ain't the way. I don't see no evidence. I, there have been times in my life, I tell you right now, I, I've been plotting for a while. I ain't seen no evidence of what God is about to do or how God is going to do it. At least not the evidence I was looking for. But, but every day, I know this is right. I know it's right to pay my tithes. I know it's right to give God the glory. I know it's right to worship. I know it's right to live well with my fellow man. I know it's right. I know it's right. I know it's right to love God. And I keep on going. And that's where we need to be. Imagine being in this place, though. And you plotting and plotting and plotting. And, and all you're trying to do is to follow the light. But you see no evidence of anything going on. Nothing at all. Too many people would have fell by the wayside. Too many people need, too many, we need to get to a point, watch this, where if God don't do nothing for us, we still love him. Where if God don't do nothing that you can see tangible, if he ain't rescued you out of nothing, if he ain't blessed you with nothing that you can see or that you want, because sometimes we see it and, and that ain't exactly what we want, so we just count it. But you got to be able to get to a point where God, if you do another, don't do another thing for me. You, you woke me up this morning. That's good enough. Let me roll on. And we got to get to a place where things and stuff and blessings don't mean nothing. Because we we are looking for a higher reward than that. Because the, the things of this life are fleeting. Imagine. If we live as long as we can. What's the longest that you've ever heard about anybody living? I mean, on some outlandish, I mean, really bizarre cases. You might hear people maybe being 110, 112, maybe 120, maybe, maybe, somewhere, you know. Uh, well, well, that's one place, well, yeah, that's one place in the Old Testament, you know, Moses lived to be 120, but there's another place that the Bible said a man years is numbered as this, um, three score and ten, and by, by reason of strength, ten more, that's eight. And, you know, that was after the um, super lives of of the near Adam descendants, mm -hmm. of the near Adam people, you know, things started, you know, right. By the time you get to the fifth or sixth chapter of, of Genesis, God says something about 120. Right. Then later on, he cut it down again, the three score and 10, that's 70 plus 10, possible, all right? But even now, I'm saying, we can hear people being 100. But guess what? 100 years is nothing to God. It's nothing. It is nothing. It, it is, it, like, oh, what is that, uh, uh, one day is a thousand, something like that? A hundred years is like two hours. <laughs> That's what it's like. 
The book of Ecclesiastes say our lives are nothing but a vapor. You know, you see it now, a puff of smoke and it's gone. And, but what we are striving for is the realness <coughs> of eternity. The realness that is only brought by the light. Darkness came with us. And we thank God that that's what we strive for. But that's where we need to get to. Well, well, being in the light means more than getting stuff. We get there, we don't know. But look, this is the funny thing. The harder you try to get stuff, the less stuff you probably get. It's like a little boy with his hand in the cookie jar. He reached in the cookie jar, got a big fist full of cookies, but can't pull his hand off. <laughs> and so they tell him, say, let some of the cookies go. No, I want all these. But if you let some of them go, you can dig back in the jar again. But, you, but, but, but that mentality is that I want what I want right now. But, but, but the realness of it is that I got to walk in the light. Because as I walk in the light, and, and then I'm going to reap the benefits of the light. And the greatest benefit of the light is eternity. That's the greatest benefit. I don't care how I live right here. And I want to live well right here. But I, I, I much rather be living well in heaven. Because that's for real. And that's for eternity. Amen? All right. It talks about in this fifth verse that darkness, that um, men were in darkness. Right. Talk about in that fifth verse, and the light shines in the darkness, and the, and, and the darkness comprehended the night. The light came. This is the scripture that's talking about how the light came to mankind that was still in darkness, and mankind did not want to be a part of the light. When he talked about they comprehended it now, this darkness was in the heart of man. Um, I'm gonna turn to Romans, Romans one. You can turn it to light. Uh, Romans one. Look at two verses. In Romans 1, I'm going to look at verse 21, and I'm going to look at verse 28. I'm going to turn there in just a few places over from Romans, or you can just, just write it down, because I'll read it for you. i got it right here. Romans 1. Romans 1. And we're going to be in verse 21 and verse 28. <coughs> Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Romans 1, verse 21. Because that when, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Mm. When they recognized who God was, they didn't glorify him as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. <coughs> yeah, you look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. You got to look at this scripture. It wasn't that they didn't know this had to be God. It wasn't. It wasn't that. But they didn't want to give him the right glory. They didn't want to give him the glory. Look at the Pharisees. They, 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 in, in spite of everything they saw and everything they had never seen before, never seen it in this level, they never heard nobody talk like Jesus. They never heard nobody teach like Jesus. Even people that did not have learning and understanding they said, this man teaches not like one of the scribes, but as one that has authority. He taught the story like he was the story. You know, it's a difference. You know, you can hear somebody tell a story of what they heard, and you can tell the person the difference between somebody talking about what they heard and somebody that was actually there. You really want to hear your story from somebody that was actually there. You don't want to just hear it from somebody who, you know, heard it through a cousin. You know, my cousin's best friend, cousin sister, told me that this is what happened all day. By the time you get it, you know, the hand, you know, think of the story all messed up. I want to hear the real deal. You know, and this is how Jesus began to talk and teach. Not, and then not only that, but, but, but he began to do miracles like they had never seen. I mean, he did miracles like, it wasn't that the um, people of Israel had never seen nobody raised from the dead. They had. But they'd always seen people raised from the dead that had just died. So really, somebody could say, oh, they just passed out. And, and um, they weren't really dead. They were, they were passed out because they got, you know, they, they got them back up. Jesus let people die for three days. And then wait another day, wait till they, wait till they wrapped up, tied up, put in the cave. And then they stinking. Then he said, roll the stone away and come forth. See, Jesus did it like that. Now, how you going to deny who this guy is? They saw him, but they refused to believe he was alive because they didn't want to give him the glory. They didn't want to give him the glory. And, this is, and see, let me tell you something, let me tell you something, let me encourage everybody in here. 
When you feel the spirit of the Lord, you better say something. <laughs> the Bible says, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. You better, be, you better learn in your heart to that when, when God deserves the glory, and really tell the truth, he deserves the glory from the time we open up our eyes. We need to learn to say, thank you, Lord. We need to learn to give God the credit. We need to learn to give him all the glory. That's, that's what giving God the glory is. To give him the credit, you, to give him the praise, to give him the worship. You better learn because this is what they did. They looked at who <coughs> God was, understood who he was, and the Bible says they refused to either be thankful or give him the glory. I'm going to tell you, sometimes I do this, and this is just really just one of the things I say. I say this all the time, but it really is a true statement. There ought to be a praise in the house. I say it all the time. And, 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 and I don't say it just to elicit a response from the people. That's the truth. There ought to be a praise in the house because God has opened our eyes. Pick this up. Oh, people, you said it all the time. Woke me up this morning, start me on my way with the right activity by, of my limbs, my help, and my strength. The, you know, I used to laugh at that because I used to get up and imitate people. And like, you know, I go home after church and I imitate Sister Lucy Lou. Lord, thank you, Lord. I'm like, I used to do it all the time. You know, but it ain't good fun. But when I got older and them bones started hurting, <laughs> can't hardly get out of the bed, right? You got to get out of the bed in pieces and all that stuff, you know. Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning and the right activity of my mind with my help and strength. All that. I mean, because it becomes, the older you live, the more you know, the more true it becomes you. Amen. But they got to a place where they could not glorify God. That's why it scared me for, for people that never found an occasion to, to, to give God glory. To give God glory. And I ain't saying everybody. You know, I preach this all the time. Nobody do it the same way. You don't do it like I do it. I don't do it like you do it. But somehow or another, we got to find a way. Birds praise Jesus all the time. They praise the Creator all the time. They, they sing it to Him. But the trees can't sing. They can't sing. Not they can't carry a note in a bucket. But they praise God because when God let the Shekinah glory blow and the wind blow, they will sway. And when it begin to rain, look, watch this. I didn't know this. There are some trees. I don't know if it's all trees. I know there are some trees. Right, right. They lift their branches up. When you get ready to rain, go ahead, Jesus. You know what that rain represents. That's the spirit of the Lord coming down. The trees got enough sense to turn their turn their palms up and lift. Oh, Jesus. You know, somebody got to know. Somebody got to know. If God make it like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know you were talking before. I know you knew. <laughs> if God got it like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. If God got it like that for his creations that were less than us, and don't forget, we was made on the sixth day. We was made last for a reason. You know, sometimes things that are last is because they got the leftovers. And because that's the runt or that's the, you know, the worst thing. We were last in a place of honor. We was, we was the creme de la creme. We was the cherry on the top. We was the crown and the cheese. God said, I done made all this other stuff. And I done spoke this stuff in there. Just let me put my hands on y'all. God just put his hands on you. Put his hands in the dirt and perform you. And not only did he form you, everything else he gave you, like he just said, all right, you can live. But else he said, I'm going to give you more than the command to live. I'm going to give you the ability to live. And to live more abundantly. So I'm going I'm to blow up in you. Amen? Blow the spirit up in you. And so, so all of that, and, and they refused to glorify him. And neither were they thankful. It's a danger. Let me tell you the danger. And that's because I said, because sometimes when I say it, folks think I'm just trying to manipulate folks. I want everybody to jump. I don't care if you jump. I, don't, I just want you to know. I just want you to know. So then you're responsible. Because if you know, you jump for yourself. You ain't got to jump because I said jump. Matter of fact, I want to see some spontaneous combustion in the church anyway. I want to be preaching. Somebody just take off running. Oh, I feel the spirit so greatly that they just take up the, the spirit just fall up in the place. I want the spirit to fall so tight up in here that I can't even preach. Because I try to preach and the Holy Ghost say no. I mean, I don't mean just just me come out the pulpit and don't preach what I got. But I mean the spirit to fall so I don't preach nothing. And all we let is the glory minister. The glory will minister to us. 
if we get to that point where we are yielded like that. And yielded. And I mean yielded. I don't mean in the, in the flesh. I don't mean carrying on for the sake of carrying on. But I mean yielded vessel. The glory. Because see, when the glory minister, he going to do more than I could ever do. I going to preach for three hours. And I couldn't do what the Holy Ghost can do in five minutes. Amen. Two minutes. Three minutes. One minute. Thirty seconds. Whatever it is. I couldn't do it. You give God the glory. Because it is it is what he is worth. The glory. And you know what? The Bible says if I had 10,000 songs, I couldn't pray for nothing. I can't do a good job with it, but I at least ought to try. That's what he said right here. They, they, they weren't thankful. And because they refused to be thankful, they, they began to move in their own vain imagination. Now, let me tell you what that means. They mean, mean that, that they begin to move in what they thought. They begin to move in their own intellect. When you begin to move in your own, not the God that I always say this, God did not tell you to pop your intellect at the door. But you got to understand your intellect comes from the Lord. And your intellect ought to be a praise unto God. What's that song? Who wrote that song? Um, J. Moss. J. J. Moss said, if I was a writer, I'd write a great dissertation. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you know, not only if I was a singer, I was singing. If I was a symbol, I'd ring and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But if he, he even broke it down because, because the intellectual part of us is a part of who God made us. But even the intellectual part of us need to bow down. If we ever get too intellectual that we can't give God the glory Ooh. and can't give God the thanks, mm -hmm. then we fall into vain imagination. Mm -hmm. The intellect that we have is not vain. What God has given you is a gift from God, and God has given you that gift that you can use it for his kingdom and now look look you ain't gonna use it for his kingdom 100 percent a day i mean as far as you're only in the church thinking about god you, you can go to work and you can Thank think you. about your work but you're still giving god the glory because you're using the gift that he gave you but when it's time to think on the lord that intellect that you got it need to be taken up to a higher level because see when we just think about what we want to think about how we want to think about it how we want to do it we are not really using what God has given us to his complete capacity. Mm. Our intellect becomes just a function of who we think we are, rather than being a function of who God made us. I want to be a function of who God made me. With whatever gift that he has given me, if he, God has given me the ability to talk a little bit. And y'all know, some of y'all really don't know. Most of y'all don't know how bad I stutter. I stutter bad. I mean, it was a time, back back in the ninth grade in Miss um, Bound class, I wouldn't even talk because I couldn't say any number. I couldn't say numbers and I couldn't say consonants because everything would get caught up in my mouth. I couldn't talk. And, and the Lord called me to preach. And I'm like, Lord, how you call me to preach? And I stopped. I started real bad. I couldn't say nothing. I couldn't hardly talk. I would rather act dumb and act like I didn't know answers rather than to try to talk because I was so embarrassed. And but look what God has done. When I yielded myself to him. I, I very rarely study in the pulpit, maybe every once in a while, but very, very rarely. And like now, I've been talking for what, almost an hour? And maybe I might have got caught up on a couple of things, but you really can't tell it because really I don't care no more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I really don't care like I used to care. You know what I'm saying? Because, because I have moved beyond who I think I am or what I think I am. And that part of that is my intellect and all that. I move beyond that and give and giving God the glory. Because this is the thing. If I can't give God the glory with all, all that I am and all that I have, I begin to think only of myself. My thoughts become vain. The power that God has given me become counterfeit and perverted. The devil ain't got to pervert what you are in God. All the devil got to do is get you to contradict what you are in God. He ain't got to pervert it. You pervert it for yourself. You will pervert it for yourself. You will pervert it because you become vain in your imagination. That means that your thoughts become of no account. They don't become of no account. I don't care what you think about it. It don't become of no account if you refuse to give God the glory. And look down at verse 28, and this is where we're going to end up at. <laughs> verse 28. And we'll have to pick up here next week because I, I know I need to talk more about it. And even though, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want to acknowledge God, they didn't want to give him the credit, they didn't want to give him the glory, they didn't want to give him the praise, because when you know him, to know him is to praise him. Well, let me tell you something like that. To know him is to praise him. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that were not convenient. Reprobate means the mind that is completely contrary to the ways of God and his word. It is depraved and corrupt. Guess what? Not praising the Lord with us. What happens? What happens if you if you um if you got something, if you got a pipe, it's under too much pressure. And you don't release, you don't have a 
release valve, it busts. And then all of a sudden it's ruptured. It can't carry the water now if it wanted to. It can't carry whatever was going to flow through it if it wanted to. Whatever was, was in it could be as good as go. It could be all from the Alaskan pipeline. It could have been water to your house. It could have been whatever. But once, once it ruptured, once it's ruptured because there was no release, then it is good for nothing. It's the same thing with us. Once we are, once we are compromised from our mindset being not willing to give God the glory, the power, the honor, the praise in our life, all of a sudden God promises this. You don't want to believe in me? You don't want to honor me? Guess what I'll do? I'll take that little bit of mind you've got left and turn it over to something that's completely contrary. And look, you know, because the world would tolerate a little bit of sin. It would tolerate a lot of sin. As long as everybody doing it. The world will tolerate almost anything. There was a time when the world did not tolerate um, um, same sex. Nothing. You know, relationships, not alone marriage. But now all of a sudden the world will tolerate enough of that. They'll tolerate. Some states are saying, yes, it's okay. The world will tolerate anything as long as everybody's doing it. But God will turn you over to some stuff that ain't nobody going to want to deal with you. <laughs> He'll turn you over to some stuff that ain't nobody want to deal with. Reprobate man will turn you over to some things that are so contrary, so depraved. And look, this is the thing about them that are under the reprobate man. You're under a reprobate man, you can't be convicted. You can't feel the conviction power. You, you get to a place where you don't feel. And remember, we talked about that convicting power is what is what saves us and brings us back to your life. Look, let me compare the convicting power to this. Um, I've had many eye surgeries. And, and some of the eye surgeries, they have to numb my eye. Well, they would always give me this crazy looking cyclops, Star Wars looking thing to put over my eye to make sure that I wouldn't scratch my eye because the eye would be numb. And you don't know what's hitting it or, or the severity of it because your eye is numb. It's numb to feel it. So you, so you might end up hurting yourself and not really knowing it. That's what a rubber baby is. Reprobate mind insulates you from the conviction, from being convicted, from being convicted in your spirit, from being convicted with the right from wrong. And when you are convicted in your spirit from what is right and wrong, guess what? You don't pull back. If you couldn't feel that the stove is hot and you picked up a pan that was burning hot, but you couldn't feel it, you just hold on to it. It would still burn you. you but you just would be numb to it if you couldn't feel it. This is what the convicting power does. It allows you to pull back, do it another way. But if you've been turned over to the reprobate mind, and I always wondered, how did you get turned over to the reprobate mind? I always wondered. I used to because I used to hear it all the time as a little boy. Reprobate mind. I used to be scared of reprobate mind. I don't want to get that. And that you know, that's crazy. I don't want, but I never knew how how you got it. But this this is what explains it right here. It is refusing to believe that God is who He says He is, and it, and, and refusing to be thankful for Him. And refusing to give him the glory. Look, that's where we're going to stop it, y'all.